All right, I preached a sermon similar to this uh, last year, but I just wanted to preach it again because I think it's always relevant and tweaked it a bit just to, to sort of make it clearer. Uh, I think what I'm, the, the, the thought that I'm trying to convey here. So the title of the sermon this morning is When to Disobey Government. When to Disobey the Government. And I think it's very, very relevant to the times we live in. And uh, that's why I preached the sermon last week. Um, because I think the, that last week's topic, if you haven't heard last week's sermon, go back. It's on the YouTube channel now, so go back and listen to it when you get an opportunity. Because I think that principle uh, plays in to the topic that we're going to talk about today. So when should we obey and disobey the government? Um, there's lots of debate on this topic. And why? Because, like I said... Uh, many issues when it comes to this topic go back to this idea of convictions of the conscience. So, like I said, go back and listen to that sermon when you get an opportunity. And this is why there is um, disagreement on how Christians ought to respond to the public health orders that are in place. Right? There's disagreement because you know, the extent to which we obey government laws is an issue of the conscience. Um, so should we obey and support these public health orders or should we resist? What is the right Christian thing to do? So this is what we're going to discuss, uh, what, we're going to, what I'm going to talk about in the sermon this morning. But first of all, let's look at the passages in Scripture that talk about obeying authority, obeying authority. And let's uh, look at what do they actually teach? What, what are they actually talking about because these are often used on both sides of the argument so like we learned about last week let's look at what the scriptures actually say and then uh, we will talk about how they'll be applied when it comes to convictions of the conscience so th the the most famous one uh, you'll, you'll always see it brought up uh, when you talk about obeying laws not obeying laws you know should christians be law-abiding citizens or not is Romans 13. So we'll go through Romans 13. We'll just talk about what Romans 13 teaches. It says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now note, it doesn't say let every soul be subject unto just any government decree, right? It says let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. So there is an authority structure that is followed, right? And what the Bible is telling us here is that we should be subject unto the higher powers. But it doesn't address the topic of what is the structure of the authority in the location that you're in, right? Are you under a king? Are you under a system of judges? Are you in a constitutional you know, monarchy like we are in? Uh, you know, these are different, different ways. You know, what are the laws in the area? Right? So there's all these questions that need to be answered, but the Bible's just saying here that you know, we ought to be subject to the powers that are there. But don't forget, any powers that exist or authority structure that exists in a country does not supersede God's laws. Right? So that's why God is always at the top. And this is why there's this discussion of well, to what extent do Christians obey the government that they find themselves in. And, um, you know, if you understand last week's sermon and you understand this week's sermon, you'll realize that it's not as simple as it seems, uh, as it first seems. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So this is often a misused verse, right? This verse one. One is people will say that it just means obey the government no matter what they tell you. And the other thing that people use this verse to, to mean is that those that are in power are there because God put them there, right? So that's not always the case either. What this is actually teaching about, it's not the people that are in power necessarily put, necessarily put there by God, right? Now, are there sometimes instances where God raises up somebody who's either wicked or good to be in that position of power? Yeah, of course, that can happen too. But that's not what they're saying, that everyone that is in power is there because of God. What this is saying is, is that there's an authority structure, right? And then God has ordained an authority structure. Like God is not a God of lawlessness. God is not a God of anarchy, right? So some people believe that, you know, um, governments and nations should be like, you know, an anarchy. There's no government. It's just, it's just all voluntary and it's just, you just decide whether you submit to a government there or not. No, as Christians, we should believe that there is a limited government. There's a place for government in a civil society to, to be governed and to create order and decide to punish crime and the things that we read about in Romans 13. So, you know, you don't want to be 
so caught up, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, with the days today where, you know, there is a, an overstepping of the mark from the authorities that we have today that, you know, sometimes Christians, they start going on the YouTube trail, right? And then they start listening to this person, listening to this person, and then they start getting into the anarchist circles, and then, and then they start thinking, hey, it's anti-government, anti-police, and we shouldn't have any of this stuff. And then you get the craziness that's happening in the United States where they're saying, defund the police. You don't defund the police. If you defund the police, like, police have a role in a society. Now, they, in our society, obviously, they're doing more than they should. We should be able to defend ourselves. But there are some times when you know, laws have to be enforced and you need officers to enforce those laws in a society because, you know, that, that's how you have order. So, no, no we, we shouldn't defund the police. You know, maybe police need less funding than they are getting. You know, they're probably getting way more than they need right now. And sometimes it's just how those funds within the police are being allocated. I mean, there's probably so much corruption going on in the police. You know, you've got uh, police commissioner Mick Fuller getting $650,000 a year. He's getting paid more than any politician. I think uh, the politicians, I think the maximum pay right now is $450,000. Police commissioner is getting like $650,000. And even in the last year, he got like a raise of $80,000. <laughs> you know, while everyone else is suffering in lockdown, police are doing quite well. But, why, you know, even police, even an entry-level police makes more than just your standard, like, average income in an entry-level job anywhere else. So sometimes the funds are not being directed very well. You don't know how those funds are being used. And even though police are getting paid so much and police commissioners are getting paid so much, their training is so lacking. You know, like, I know, like, there's a police officer that I know um, where I train jiu-jitsu, and we talk about this, and it's like, I, you know, I, he's, he's coming to get jiu-jitsu training, and it's like, he has to pay for it on his own. It's like, you're a police officer. You don't even get any self-defense training at all. No, it's like, uh, they do a couple of weeks in the first year, and then that's it. And it's like, well, what about driving training? Yeah, you do like one driving course in the first year, and then that's it. It's like, how often do you shoot your pistol? It's like, once a year. It's like, so you've got like deadly weapons. You're like, you know, enforcing these laws. And you don't get like, you don't have any training in like self-defense or anything. It's like, what are they spending their money on? You know, so, but they should be there. But obviously, the way they're being run right now is, is absolutely terrible. And, and the danger of police not being trained, you know, in the things that they should use is that they resort to force more often, right? Like if, if they're dealing with somebody and then they feel threatened, they're more likely to pull out the weapon rather than just restrain them with skills that they have. So I think it's very important that police are trained and that they're there. Um, so we, the point I'm making is that there is a place for government. There's limited responsibilities for government. There's a place for police officers. And the, the structure, God would want that, right? That there's, that, that's what's ordained, that there is structure. Just like there's structure in a church, just like there's structure in a family, there should be structure in a nation too. And this is what God is talking about here, that, that God has set this structure to be there for these reasons, right? And that's why it says, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, the authority, resisteth the ordinance of God, right? So if somebody's an anarchist and thinks like there shouldn't be any authority, in, then they're resisting what God would intend for how a nation should be run. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, why is that? It's not that, you know, anyone that resists anything the government says resists them. Why? Because there's a, there's a purpose for why it's there. What's the purpose that God had for these authorities that, that he's ordained in a nation? For rulers are not a terror to good works. So you see there, you're not meant to be damned by the government. You're not meant to be doing things like imprisoned or arrested or fined and punished by the government when you do good. It's when you do evil, right? When you're trying to harm others. That's the purpose of government, right? To punish the evildoers. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Right? So if you're doing righteousness, then you should be praised, right? Rather than condemned or damned. Yeah. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. You see, so what why why does why does God give authority to a father or a husband in a family, a bishop in a church, leaders in a country. Why do they? Why should they have that authority? Because they're meant to be 
the minister of God to thee for good. That's the, the purpose of it. That's not what always happens. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. So that's where this idea of that, you know, governments can punish people. They do have that authority. So that's why capital punishment is not murder, right? Because capital punishment, first of all, has, has been given authority by the government to execute. And also, you're not executing somebody that's innocent. Usually, you're executing somebody that's, that's um, deserving of it, right? It's committed a crime that's worthy of capital punishment. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake, right? So it's like you know now that God has this in place, so this is why we submit to the authorities that are there. For for this cause pay you tribute also. So he's saying this is why we should also be paying taxes, right? So whilst I understand that a lot of libertarians will say taxation is theft, I wouldn't say taxation is theft. I just think it's that overtaxation is completely unwise and draining on an economy and gets spent unwisely. Um, but there is a place for taxation, right? Why? Because it needs to pay for these ministers, right? It's, it's no different to in a church, right? Why do you give offerings? It's because to pay for the people that do the work that would not otherwise be paid. Attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. So there is a place of government in a civil society. We're commanded to be subject under the higher powers. So understand that God has ordained an authority structure, right? And there should be authority there. It's not that he's just ordained each individual that is in that authority. And this is not a blanket command to obey just all laws created by human governments. Why? Well, one is, I mean, think about this. What about exercising power, like powers or rights afforded you by the laws of the land? Right? That's not disobeying authority. Right? So some people will think, well, well, people that are exercising their rights, right, or people that are standing up for their rights, oh, they're not submitting to the government. Well, no, actually they are, you know, because that, that's not even a spiritual thing. That's just, the, if the highest authority in the land is the laws of the land, and they're standing up for their rights that are the laws of the land, and somebody's not keeping the laws of the land, they are actually keeping the laws. They're actually the law-abiding citizen, right? Law-abiding law citizen. And we see examples of this in the Bible where people, you know, exercise their rights, and, um, you know, they're not being obviously, you know, sinful at all. Luke 23, here's uh, where we see Jesus. He says, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged under Herod's jurisdi jurisdiction, um, sorry, I think this is actually, oh no, no, this is actually, this is Jesus, right? I'm getting confused. I've got an example from Paul as well. As soon as he knew that he belonged under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. So this is him referring to Jesus. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he had hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. So you think, well, the king, you know, is asking you questions, you know, or the, the governor here. Surely, you know, you should respect the authority and answer him. But no, Jesus, Jesus obviously did not sin here, and yet he remained silent. He, he, he sort of used his right to remain silent and not answer. So sometimes when you watch a video where people uh, you know, have an encounter with the police, and the police are going, oh, where are you going? What are you doing? You know, give me this, give me that. And the person's like, I don't need to give you this. I don't need to answer your questions. And you're thinking, you know, oh, if they're a Christian, shouldn't they be just obeying the government and submitting to the authority? No, because if they have the right to remain silent, if they have the right to not answer these questions, then they, they, they don't need to obey rules or commands from officers that are unlawful, right? And police know this. Police know that sometimes, you know, in our country especially, that their powers are limited, right? And that's why they have to, like, trick you into answering questions because you, you just assume that you have to answer their questions. So they just ask you all sorts of questions and then you end up incriminating yourself. Like they may not even have evidence of you speeding, but they ask you the question, do you know how fast you're going? You know what? You know why they ask you that? Because you go, oh, oh, oh. and then you incriminate yourself, 
right? But sometimes if you just don't say anything, they got really nothing against you and they might just have to let you go or try and find some defect on your car, right? Which is what police do just to, to be annoying. But it's the same like when they come to your house. Like sometimes they come to your house and they knock on your door. Do you know that you don't have to answer the door? <laughs> you won't be in trouble. It's actually for them to try and trick you into answering the door and letting them in. But unless they have a warrant, they can't come in and search your house and question you. Like they can knock on the door all they want and if you just don't answer it, there's nothing they can do, right? Because they have no right to come into your property unless they go to the court and get a warrant and those sorts of things. So my point in that situation is, are you being disobedient to the God-ordained authorities when you're just standing up for the rights you have in a country? Well, no. And we see Jesus here using his right to remain silent. Um, even here, Paul, you know, his rights as a Roman where he appeals to a higher authority. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he himself, while he answered for himself, neither against the, the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything at all. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, so you see how Festus here is not necessarily doing what's right by Paul, he's just trying to please the crowd, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things, whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. So you see how he's, he understands his rights as a Roman citizen, and he's exercising them, right? It's not that he's not obeying the authorities here and going along with what they want to do. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar thou shalt go. So he gets what he asked for in that situation. So, again, um, you know, just because people exercise certain rights or privileges that they are afforded in a country, um, just because people don't necessarily know the law, you know, they may accuse those people of, you know, being disobedient to authority. But in that specific instance, that's just them standing up for the rights that they have. Let's look at the other verses quickly. 1 Peter 2, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. So again, remember, it, 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 these are not, these passages are never just blanket statements, right? Because obviously we have God's commandments in the Bible. So, you know, even, even the fact that we are submitting to every ordinance of man, we're not just doing it blindly i mean we're doing it because god commands us to do it so obviously if god commands us to do things th that's the reason why we're doing it it's not the other way it's not the other way around that you disregard what god has commanded you in order to obey man's word uh, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers so again they're that reason why they ought to exist and what their purpose is and for the praise of them that do well for so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of mal maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Here's another one in Titus 3.1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. So you, there is this idea, you know, don't get me wrong, there is this idea uh, in the Bible, that we are to submit to authority. That's, a, that's what we're talking about. Or what I'm trying to clarify here is we don't just submit to any command given by an authority in a country, right? Because sometimes those things go against the laws of God. To be ready to every good work. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation, right? So there's people that rule over you, and I, I might have not got the right verse there, actually. I think I wanted a different one in Romans 13, where it talks about, you know, you want to um, submit to them because it's sort of, um, you know, better for you that they do it with joy and not with grief, grievous. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. 
So this verse is often used to say, oh, you know, you shouldn't be speaking out against authority, even though, you know, John the Baptist did, and, you know, Nathan went to David and told him off the things that he was doing. Um, they'll say, you know, you should just pray for them, pray that they have, you know, wisdom and pray that they have success in what they do. I mean, first of all, this doesn't just pray that you just wish them every success. And wish them. This just says to just pray for them, right? And why are we praying for them? What's the purpose of our prayers for them? To, to get an idea of how should we pray for them? Well, the idea is that we want to pray that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So sometimes a, a way to live a life in all godliness and honesty is to pray that that person is removed from office somehow, right? And if they can be removed from office, that may be the best way to pray for that king or that authority, you know, so that we can lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. And of course, if somebody is doing the right thing, you know, we want to pray that they will be used to influence good in our society. So this is just not blindly just praying, you know, you know, you have, you know, you have wicked politicians out there, you know, pro-abortion and pro-same-sex marriage and pro everything that is you know, against Christianity, you know, you shouldn't be, we shouldn't be teaching that Christians just pray for the good and success of their office. Like, of course not, right? We're going to pray that, that they will be stopped um, however way God wills um, so that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, right? So the, the goal is not just, just leave me alone and you know, let the country go to hell just, just as long as, you know, my little world is doing okay. We, we want to pray that, that, that we can live in godliness, right, in a godly country. So um, just consider that when you are praying for our country. All right, so that's scriptures talking about obeying authority. And like I said, it's not a these are not blanket commands to obey every single command that we're given. Why? Because we have examples in the Bible where the disciples are, and, and other situations in the Bible, where they are disobeying authority. Right? So that's, that's what opens up this argument of, well, obviously there, there is cause to disobey governments, so where's that line? Well, before we get to that conversation, let's look at some examples here in the Bible of when people disobeyed the government. Acts 5 verse 17, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. All right, so here the disciples preaching the gospel. They're put in jail. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple of the, to the people all the words of this life. Now, this situation is a little bit different to you know, the application that we find in our lives because, you know, Man, I wish that in every decision in my life there was just a clear scripture to tell me exactly what to do, right? You know, it's like the jail cell is open. They're probably thinking, hmm, should I go back and just do what caused me to get thrown into prison? And there's no doubt now because the Spirit says to you, go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. But, you know, we're not given that clear direction in every decision in our life. So we sometimes have to make a decision. What is the wisest thing to do with the information that I have? Um... But here, they were given a direct command by the Spirit to do this. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. And when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, I always, I always uh, find this verse so funny. Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. <laughs> then when the captain, so they're trying to figure out where these people are, and it's like, well, the people that we had jailed, they're back where we got them from. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. 
And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you? Ah, so here they, they were given a command from the authorities. They didn't keep it. That you should not teach in this name. And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the apostles answered and said, the famous uh, verse here, we ought to obey God rather than men. Right, so, you know, this principle here needs to be harmonized with Romans 13 and 1 Peter and all the other verses we read. It's not just about just obeying anything that's commanded, right? Because you have to obey God rather than men. Let's look at another example in Exodus 1. Exodus 1, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other, Pua. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then ye shall live. But the midwives feared God. Right? They feared God, so they didn't obey and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men, children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing? And have saved the men and children alive. And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. What, is, what are they saying? They're saying like, why didn't you kill the sons? They're saying, yeah, well, it's because the, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. Like, they, they just give birth without us, basically. You know? So they, what are they? They're deceiving the Pharaoh here. Now, are they in sin here? Well, I don't think so, because, you know, deception is not always wrong when you're trying to save lives here, you know? Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. So he made sure that they were taken care of. Um, and we see here that the midwives, directly disobeying, commands to do something evil, um, which is commit genocide against the sons of um, the Israelites. Um, Verse 22, and Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born he shall cast into the river, and every daughter he shall save alive. So even uh, to the Egyptians. Um, seems like he was doing that. Um, oh, unless I, sorry, I think that's like he's telling his people to, to make sure the, the Israelite children are done like that. So there's another example. And uh, you see there that the, in that example, it is not that the Hebrew midwives just blatantly you know, were saying, Oh, this is what we're doing. They did it, but then they were doing it deceitfully, right? You know, and that was the right thing to do in that instance where they disobeyed the authority and told them, you know, deceived them into thinking something else was happening in order to protect people, right? Daniel 6, verse 6. Here's another example. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. I feel like, you know, in the situation we live in today, I mean, I think Daniel's situation is, is the closest, right? Um, but, you know, obviously not always exactly the same. I mean, he's, he's somebody, obviously, that's like second to the king at this point as well. Um, so he's somebody of, of much authority, and uh, maybe he thought he could make a big change uh, in, in taking a stand. But, you know, I think his situation is the most interesting because it's, it's so similar to the situation we find ourselves in today. I mean, just remember that this law to not pray to God, not to, to, own, uh, to not be able to pray to any other God save the king, right, at that time, it was a temporary law. Man, doesn't that remind you of the, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, 14 days to... Curve, curve the spread, right? Or, you know, remember when they first started saying, uh, you know, you can't gather, you can't this. Oh, it's just for a temporary time. And what did Christians say? Oh, yeah, well, we'll go along with it. It's just, it's just temporary. It's not wrong right because it's temporary. Well, this was temporary. I don't see Daniel thinking that it was okay with it, you know? But uh, this is for a temporary time. It was just, hey, just for 30 days, you don't have to pray to God. You know, you only pray to the king if you want to pray. Um, and after 30 days, you can go back to praying to God again, right? 
Verse 8, Now O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, so now he, so we know that Daniel did this not ignorantly, right? He did it knowing that he was going to break this law. He went into his house and his windows being open. So not only did he knowingly break the law, he, he did it in a way knowing that he would be seen, right? In his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four times. And you know the rest of the story. So he's caught, and he's dobbed on, and then he's thrown into the den of the lions, but then God obviously protects him from the den of the lions. Now, what... What this, this doesn't mean everybody should do this in, in every instance, right? Because this is what Daniel did. Because you could say, like, well, what if, Daniel, what if Daniel said, you know what, it's illegal to pray, so I'll just do it with my windows closed. Would he be in sin? Well, he wouldn't be in sin. But for some reason, he chose to do it openly, right? And to take that stand. So this is what we're talking about today. To what extent do you take this stand? Does that mean we always do this in every instance? Or do we do it? I mean, this is where there's, there's a gray area of how to do things the most wisely. But what we can see here is that if somebody chose to take this stand, right, and go, you know what, I'm disobeying this law, I'm doing it publicly, you know, I'm not going to stop, even if it's for a temporary time, I'm going to do it. Are they wrong? No, they're not. And, but I can imagine that if this was the situation today, all the Christians and probably all of the people in Daniel's day were just saying, look, just don't pray. Or if you're going to pray, just close the window. It's only for 30 days. It's only for 30 days, right? And then after 30 days, we can go back to it. You know, it's our, it's our Christian duty to submit to the authorities. So, you, know, the, you know, Romans 13, you know, they're quoting Romans 13 to Daniel <laughs> back then, just prophetically, because they didn't actually have it written back then. <laughs> you know, every, every soul be subject to the higher powers. I don't know. So, but it wasn't wrong for him to take that stand. Now, that's not saying everybody it's right in every instance to take this stand. It might be wiser not to do it. But, you know, Daniel being one of the wisest believers that ever lived, you know, here in his situation, probably thought that that was the wisest thing to do. So, I just find it very uh, similar to our situation today. So, when to disobey. When to disobey the government. Now, when people talk about this topic, generally the principle is you obey the law. You, we should be law-abiding citizens, but unless the government causes us to sin. Now, if you now understand what I taught on last week, that's not as clear-cut as even I've always thought it was to be. You know, because I thought, you know, well, that's pretty obvious, right? If, you, if the government tells you to sin, you disobey, you obey God. But then when now you've been forced in a situation where you have to decide, am I you know, actually sinning or not to break these laws? Now, now it's a bit, a bit closer to home now. And you, you realize, hey, this is not actually as clear cut as we think. Because why? Because determining whether something is a sin or not, it's not always just the line is here and this is sin and this is not a sin because it's based on conscience. It can be based on situation. It can be based on different scenarios. It can be based on what's being asked of you. But this is where people have to exercise their conscience. You know, it will exercise what they believe is right by their conscience, and that might change the action that you do. And this is why there are people on both sides of this argument, even when it comes to the public health orders of our day. So remember, not only do we have clear statements in the Bible, but even how to apply those statements, right? Even something as simple as do not kill. Right? Is not as quick as you say, never kill. And then you have the people that are unwise and just go, we should never kill. Even if somebody's like got a gun and it's going to kill your whole family, you don't kill. It's like, no, because that's not what the Bible's talking about when it's talking about killing. It's talking about murder, right? It's not talking about killing in self defense. It's not talking about when people go to war. It's not talking about capital punishment. It's not talking about things like that. But if people don't understand that there's a difference, and there's sometimes nuance to what the judgment should be. And has somebody actually broken that commandment? 
then it's the same thing when it comes to disobeying the government. If people don't understand that there is this nuance, that there is convictions of the conscience, then they will end up condemning people for something that they shouldn't be condemned for. And a lot of the things that are relevant to these current public health orders fit into this category, right? But before we go on to those, so Romans 14, 23, remember these from last week. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And I think, what, I believe what this is teaching, Romans 14, is if you do not believe something is right to do, right? You're not doing it of faith, right? Then, it, then it's, it's a sin, right, for you to do, because you don't believe it's the right thing to do. And James 4 is the opposite. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So again, you have this idea that if you believe something is right to do, right, even though it's not commanded specifically in the Bible, but it's something you believe, hey, this is something right that is righteous and should be fought for, if you don't do it to him, it is sin. See, so how, so this is why it's there's a divide over, you know, when there are these laws that are not necessarily specified in the Bible, to what extent do Christians resist? Well, there's no clear-cut answer, right? Because the question is, to what extent do you believe the government has the right to intrude into this area of life and is it worth fighting for, right? So people are going to be divided over, well, it's not worth fighting for, we should just submit. And other people are thinking, no, I can see the, the Nazi propaganda creeping up on us and I'm going to take the stand here before it becomes any worse. Well, this is why it's, uh, it's not a clear-cut thing. But if you understand then you can understand why this conflict exists. And it, what, what I find interesting, that this, these two angles of not believing what is right and doing it anyway, and then knowing something to do and then not doing it, being a sin, is also something alluded to by Paul in Romans 7. Right? For I, so Paul here, referring to that internal struggle, also addresses these two issues, right? For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Right? So he knows that it's good to do. He's not doing it, right? And that's the sin that he's committing there. For the good that I would, I do not. You see that sin? The good that I would. He knows it's good to do it. He kind of wants it. In the spirit, he wants to do it, but he doesn't do it, right? His flesh. So that's, that's the sin there. But the evil which I would not, that I do. So that is, you know, the good that he's not, that, the, the bad, he, know, he knows it's not right, and he does it. See? So you can see the both angles there in Romans 7 as well, when we would compare that to Romans 14, 23 and James 4, 17. All right, so let's talk about the recent public health orders. Um, the example I'll spend the most time on, and that will sort of explain the principle, is this, this idea of like, you know, gather, gathering, right? You know, and then they say, well, churches shouldn't gather. And then there was, remember, even amongst Christian circles, if you look at the comments on Facebook, you have some people going, yes, it's our Christian duty to not gather and not help the spread of the virus. And we're doing right by our fellow neighbor and we're not doing that. So we shouldn't meet. But then there are people saying, no, this, this is a fraud, you know, it's like authoritarianism, you know, people should be allowed to take the risk and we should be able to meet. Why is there this divide on different opinions? Because it's a conviction of the conscience, right? Look what the Bible says, because this is when we talk about the Bible commanding us to meet for church. Let's take our last week's sermon into consideration, right? Hebrews 10. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, this is the verse in the Bible that most people will turn to when they talk about, hey, it's commanded for you to, to go to church, right? Now, if we're honest, this verse does not tell us, well, when to meet, how often to meet, all those sorts of things, right? So the command doesn't specify these things. So if you don't take into account convictions of the conscience, it's like, well, why do people believe that you should meet once a week? Abel, Timothy, stop playing with you. If you don't take into account convictions of the conscience, right? Why do people meet once a week? Why do they believe? Well, this is a conviction. You know, to think that what's wise, that you have the regularity of meeting every week and the reminder of a week. Some people think you should meet more times a week. 
you know, three times a week. Some people think it's okay to meet once a month. I, mean, I personally think that's too little. But, you know, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that's a conviction of the conscience. It's not, it's not something that's commanded in the Bible. So if you don't take into account con convictions of the conscience, then you could argue that government outlawing church for a temporary time is not a sinful act and should be obeyed. Right? Because if, if, you, if your position is anything that's not sinful, we should obey, then if the government says you can't go to church for three months, then you can see how they could justify that. But is it right? Right? So Christians would say, well, they shouldn't have the right to tell me I don't have to. But, you know, you can see how if you don't take into account, if you don't understand these convictions of the conscience and you just start thinking, well, anything that's not sinful, we should just obey, you're going to start supporting when the government says, well, you can't meet here, you can't meet there, you can't meet for this amount of time. What else are we going to allow them to say that we can do just because it's not sinful? You know, because they'll say, like, they're not banning church completely. It's just for a temporary time for your safety and for the safety of others, right? So there's, there's justification there for why they're saying it to do, but should we obey, right? Think about it this way. What if the government, rather than just thinking, okay, this is the government story, right? The government story is, you know, just don't meet for a temporary time for our safety and blah, blah, blah. Now, if people support that, well, what if the government made a law that you could only attend church twice per year? Should that be obeyed? You'd say no. But if you just think we should just obey everything that's not sinful, then that should be obeyed, right? If you believe that. Because is it, are you technically in sin? Have you, have you forsaken the assembling of yourselves together if you meet twice a year? But should the government be able to set the limit of how many times? So you can see this is, a, this is an issue of the conscience, isn't it? If you believe, no, that's not right. I should be able to attend church as often as I want, you know, and, and have the liberty to obey God according to my conscience, then you'll take the stand, won't you? You'll go, no, I should, I should meet even if the government tells me not to. But are you technically sinning if you obeyed that law? No, but you would be if you believe you should be going more often and you don't, right? So, you know, where is the line? It's a matter of conviction, isn't it? Uh, and this is why Christians are on both sides of the debate. You know, people who believe that there was a real risk think it's the Christian duty to refrain from gathering, right? But some who were unsure, I mean, even some who were unsure of the deadliness of the virus in the beginning thought it was reasonable just to meet, not meet for a temporary time, just to make sure that everything was worked out okay before they, you know, put their congregations at risk again. But then there were Christians like myself who still wanted to gather and believed the government had no place telling Christians when and how often to gather. Um, so why is it somewhat inconclusive in the end? because it's a conviction of the conscience. So let's think of some other things that the public health order has outlawed, right, that would sit into this same category. What about singing? Not being able to sing in groups, you know? Now, is it technically illegal to not, or is it technically sinful to not sin, uh, sing for a temporary time? But should they have the right to tell us when to sing? Well, I mean, you know, it's like, should the government tell you how to praise God when you gather. You know, I hear of churches during this time, you know, either not singing or churches that are like humming, you know, you know, and that's just, uh, it's just sad. I mean, I just wish more Christians, um, you know, just took the stand. Well, more church leaders just didn't obey these laws. Um, you know, what if the government starts making a law about the, the style of music you can use and the types of instruments you can use? I mean, this is where this logic will lead you if you don't take into account, like I said, these convictions of the conscience. Uh, you know, a very prominent Christian um, in today's day uh, did a post on Facebook advising Christians not to attend protests and saying, you know, basically saying this argument of, well, it's not a sin to not attend protests. So therefore, Christians should obey that law to not attend protests because of Romans 13 and you know, all the verses that I'm talking to you about today. 
Now, is he wrong in advocating that view? No. But is it wrong for Christians who don't agree with that view to then go out and go to those protests? Well, it's not, right? Because they may believe that they have the freedom to protest tyranny because that's, you know, maybe the right and good thing to do, right? But you can understand now why there's a divide over why Christians say, how can you be a Christian, be going and doing this, you're an idiot, blah, 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 blah. But then the other people are like, well, how can you just let this happen and not do anything? Because it's this difference of knowing to do good and doing it not. What is the right thing to do in this instance? Well, it's going to depend on what your convictions are, right? And what you think is the right thing to do. And it's not a clear-cut answer. That's why it's going to be an inconclusive debate. But, you know, we... You know, we praise freedom fighters of the past, but I'm sure they were hated at that time as well. Um, you know, I'm sure, you know, even back then, you know, I wonder how many people, you know, would have told Daniel, you know, Daniel, you know, he's making it harder for all of us. You know, if you just, you know, nothing's stopping you from just praying in your house with your windows shut, you know, and just take the heat off us. No, well... I'm sure people were saying that back then as well. Vaccines. You know, this was my challenge to this person. I don't know if he read my comment on his post. Hopefully he did. Well, my challenge to this individual was, okay, well, if we should just obey anything that the government says not to do. I said, well, what if the, church, what if the government says you can only go to church twice a week? Or tw uh, you know, twice, a, twice a year. What if the government says now this vaccine is mandatory? Do you know it's not sinful to take a vaccine? You know? But should the government be able to tell you what medications you have to take? Do you know what I mean? So where, 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 you know, if you don't take into account convictions of the conscience, what are you going to be telling Christians to do next that the government commands us to do? Right? So, I mean, I think about all these uh, things. I mean, what about masks? Should the government tell you what garments to wear? You know, I mean, it's not a sin to wear a mask, but should the government tell you what you can and can't wear? I mean, people are outraged at, you know, at the Muslims, right? I mean, they say that their women have to wear the burqas and all that sort of stuff, and people are all up in arms. And now the government's telling you to wear this thing over your face, and where's the outrage now? You know, and I just think, you know, it's, it's hard not to be reminded of these, uh, you know, these visual cues. You know, I was watching the, those movies about the, the Holocaust and whatnot. And I just thought it was crazy that I was getting them to wear like the yellow star and getting them to wear like the band on their arm just so that they were publicly identified. And, you know, I think we're coming there, right? I'm sure that sooner or later, you know, garments for the unvaccinated are coming. And, you know, ignorant Christians will probably say, you know, it's not a sin to put on the armband to tell everyone you're not unvaccinated, so wear it. You know, be the, be the good, you know, obedient Christian that, that they're telling everyone that that's how they are, you know, misinterpreting or misunderstanding those verses and how they align with convictions. QR codes. Should the government be able to track you? Do we not have a right to privacy? Is it a sin to tell the government where you are, where you shop, what you think, you know, all your thoughts? It's not. But don't we have a right to privacy? You know, you know, I gotta admit that, you know, I didn't I didn't appreciate my privacy until doing what was right made me a criminal. And I think a lot of people don't really appreciate the right to privacy and you know, a lot of the fights on, you know, maintain you know metadata being collected through your website your searches all that sort of stuff see sometimes people say you know well I don't mind being you know spied on or whatever I got nothing to hide everyone's got something to hide otherwise why do you wear clothes you know obviously everyone's got something to hide but the question is it's it's not it's never whether you know you know do you have something to hide it's it's what happens when what you do becomes criminal and it shouldn't be. Because that's the situation we find ourselves in now. You know, I never really, you know, uh, valued my right to privacy until I realized the things that I'm doing right are now criminal. You know, then it's, then the right to privacy is important. 
because <sighs> it's who that information is in the hands of. That's the problem. So, a couple of few closing thoughts. You know, safe, safety, safety is like this new magic word, isn't it? Please, please used to be the magic word. Consent, right? Now it's just safety. You know, all these things that I'm talking about, people will be outraged, but why aren't they? Because it's for your safety. <laughs> it's for your... It's for your safety, right? Most people would be outraged, like I said, at the tyranny that's going on, but if it's for our safety, for some reason, it's fine. I, I sort of um, came up with this phrase, and it's nothing new, but it says, if you're 100% safe, it means you're 0% free. And this is what I think people have to understand, that um, safety and liberty are like opposites, right? You could be 100% safe if you remove all your liberty, right? So that's why there's always going to be a balance. There's always got to be a balance of what's the cost of removing the liberty in order to gain the safety. It's not just safety at all costs. And this is what's happening in our country right now. Just, just this, this mania on safety and fear of death from COVID and it's just justifying just removing everyone's liberty. Right? But at what cost? I mean, people say, well, lockdowns have worked. Well, of course they've worked. It's like if you remove all the cars off the road, you're going you're gonna to remove all accidents, aren't you? You're going to remove deaths by cars, but at what cost? You know, so yeah, of course lockdowns are going to stop the spread when you just lock people in their homes. I'm sure in a prison, right, when everyone's in their cells, and that's a very COVID-safe environment too. But at what cost to people's liberty? At what cost to the economy? At what cost to people's lives and their mental health and everything? And this is what is not being considered by our politicians. They, they don't talk about, you know, the suicide rates going up. They don't talk about the adverse reactions from vaccines. They don't talk about all the business closures. I mean, maybe if they showed how many COVID deaths versus how many livelihoods have been destroyed, people would have a different view on what's happening, right? But they don't. And that's the problem we see today. So, in conclusion, we talked about scriptures where we're told to obey the authorities, and we, talk, we understand that now. We talked about scriptures where people disobeyed authority. And then we talked about, you know, how conscience plays a part. So I think it's very important that we understand how conscience plays a part in the Christian life and in judging what is right and wrong and then how it then applies to principles like this of obeying the government unless they cause us to sin because that line is not always clear cut and this is why there's always a divide even amongst Christians right, on what is the right thing to do. But what I want you to take away from this sermon is one is don't promote a blind obedience to the government right, and to your children. right. Don't promote a blind allegiance to a country Right? Because the country doesn't always do what is right. You know, our allegiance should be to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So, you know, let's pray that God will give us you know, courage and wisdom to do what's right in this uh, day and age we live in. You know, otherwise, the freedoms that we take for granted may no longer be there in the world that we leave our children. All right, so let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word this morning. I pray, Lord, that this sermon encourages people to do what's right. Understand, Lord, why there is so much debate on what is the right thing to do. And uh, Lord, I pray that you give us the courage and the wisdom and the boldness to take a stand so that we can change the world that we live in. So help us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.